she because bhakti is in sanskrit a feminine gender you can use the word devotion but it does not convey that meaning of bhakti it has got the gentleness the motherly affection care which is extremely feminine and that can definitely be conveyed by the word bhakti which is in feminine gender sa bhakti tasmin param prema roopa this bhakti is of the highest love for him and him is a pronoun you can use a pronoun only when the proper noun has been used before rama is dashratha's son he goes to forest he is a pronoun and it will become meaningful only if you have said the first sentence the second sentence if you use he goes to forest has no meaning who he who he the pronoun he has to be shown to you by a word which has been previously used but here in the bhakti sutras no name the bhakti sutra does not say krishne parama prema roopa shive parama prema roopa durgayam parama prema roopa no nothing only a pronoun in that now that is something you can give your name call it krishna call it ram call it shiva call it durga it is absolutely your choice no compartmentalization no political parties created over here sat tasmin parama prema roopa this is bhakti shastra showing you and therefore the scriptures are more interested in showing you what is that reality that reality we are calling as narayana that reality we are calling as shiva we are using these names we are using these forms so that you can come close and realize it that he is more important before we i explain you because it is a very simple thing it is not a very difficult puzzle or anything like that in the kano upanishad there goes this story the devatas were enjoying and celebrating their victory over the asuras each devata was boasting of his own prowess agni said i have done so much and this is my prowess vayu says this is my prowess so on and so forth every devata was boasting about his own strength and suddenly they see one yaksha yaksha is a celestial being but yaksha is a celestial being a little lower than the devatas than the gods it is a celestial being a very resplendent yaksha appears in the sky and he is standing far higher than the devatas the devatas taken offense who is this yaksha and this yaksha doesn't seem to be this ordinary because every devata present over there was drawn to this yaksha suddenly all their music dance drinking eating everything comes to a halt and everyone's eyes are fixed on this yaksha they have a question who this yaksha is 
all the devatas request Agni to go and find out who this Yaksha is. They say, Agni, you go. Agni approaches this Yaksha with all his palm. And even before Agni could speak, Yaksha asks him a question. Kosi, who are you? Kaha asi, who are you? Even a child would know it is fire. Fire does not require anybody's introduction. Fire is self-evident. It is dangerous. Even the most illiterate person also would know what is fire. And here is Yaksha asking the question directly to fire. Who are you? Kosi. Who are you? Fire does not know what he has come over there to ask Yaksha who this Yaksha is. And fire finds that Yaksha is asking this question. Who are you? The pride that fire has is powdered. Because fire thought that everybody over here knows me. Whether it is the devatas in the swarga or the manavas in the martya loka, everybody recognizes me. There is not a single organism which does not know fire. And here you are asking me. He says, I am fire. You could be fire, but what is it that you have? What is your strength? What can you do? Yaksha asks him, fire says, I can burn down everything. The Trilokya, I can burn it down all the three worlds. Yaksha takes a small blade of grass and keeps it in front of this Agni and says, now burn it. Agni tries with all his might to burn a simple blade of grass and nothing happens. The blade of grass does not even get scorched, forget burning, does not happen. Fire, this Agni, hanging his head down in shame, returns back without an answer. Who this Yaksha is? The question still remains, who this Yaksha is? The Devata's request, Vayu, you go. You find out you are powerful. Why don't you go and do that? Same thing happens. Even before Vayu can open his mouth, this resplendent Yaksha asks him, Who are you? Aham Vayu. I am Vayu. What can you do? He says, I can blow away everything over here. He says, there is a blade of grass lying over there. Can you blow that away? Can you shake it? Can you move it? Why you tries? And that blade of grass doesn't even tremble. Why you is defeated? Goes back again without an answer. Yet, nobody knows who this Yaksha is. All that they have known is they are powerless. They are just powerless. They, they request Indra, saying, Indra, you are the king of heaven. You should go and talk to this Yaksha. Indra comes closer to this Yaksha. And this Yaksha totally ignores Indra's coming and disappears. With the other devatas, at least this Yaksha has spoken to them. But this Yaksha does not even care to register that there is King of Heaven. Indra is insulted. And in that insult, Indra becomes extremely disappointed. And he prays 
that he wants to know who this Yaksha is. Kena Upanishad says, in the same space, pay attention to this, this is an important part. In the same space where Yaksha was standing, appears the Uma Haimavati, the daughter of Himalayas, resplendent with a golden sari, she appears and she speaks to Indra. She tells Indra, Indra, this is Parmeshwar. Tasmin Akashe Uma Haimavati Pradur Babuva that Uma, the daughter of Himalayas, appears over there and she introduces, she tells him who this Yaksha is. This Yaksha is Paramatma. Indra, all the strength that you have belongs to Parmeshwara. Nothing belongs to you. And he who knows this Parmeshwara goes beyond every form of grief. To introduce Parmeshwara, the Shakti of Parmeshwara alone is responsible. It is impossible to know the Lord without Uma or Mahalakshmi blessing you. This is Uma. This is Lakshmi. The word Uma is also consisting of U, Ma and A, which are the three letters of Om. A, U and Ma. She speaks to me. This is the mother with whose grace, with whose blessings alone it is possible to know Parmeshwara. And this is the Shakti. Whether you call her as Uma or you call her as Lakshmi. Whether you recognize her as the daughter of Himalayas or you recognize her as the daughter of the ocean. Without her grace, the darshan of the Lord is not possible. And that is the real splendor. The ocean may be inert, the mountain may be inert, but it is from the same inertness. Will it be possible to behold that what is consciousness? It is only through this buddhi that buddhi is inert. From that inert buddhi only it is possible to know the Supreme Truth. The way the scriptures speak is a language of the Puranas embedded in the stories. But there is a message and that message has to decipher. It is given so that you can employ yourself to that, so that you can employ your buddhi to, to solve that puzzle, to solve that riddle. Do not consider these stories only as some stories for entertainment as cock and bull stories. This is just not a system of belief of the Hindus, but it is a way, it is a method, it is a system for your buddhi, for your intelligence to rise and realize both. To rise and realize. Both these things are possible. So, Indra, in his arrogance, has insulted 
Durvasan. As a result of this, all his splendor, wealth, opulence sinks down into the milky ocean. Now this milky ocean has to be churned for Mahalakshmi to come out. And look at both of them. This is the beauty. Whether it is Shiva or whether it is Vishnu, both these son-in-laws are living in their father-in-law's houses. <laughs> Vishnu is also reclining on that Shesha, Ananta, in Milky Ocean. And Bhagavan Shiva is also absorbed in Samadhi in Himalayas. Both these daughters have done the job. They have brought their husbands to stay over there. Or else where would they go? Where they don't have their own homes. 